In this video, I'll show you how to implement role-based authorization in your .NET applications. We're going to create multiple roles with different levels of access, and we're going to integrate this into our JSON web tokens. This will be our starting point. I have a .NET 9 application that's already implementing authentication with JSON web tokens. In the user's feature folder, there is a token provider class, which handles creating and signing a JSON web token and it includes some default claims. So we're going to extend this to introduce support for adding roles as claims inside of the JSON web token, which we can use to implement authorization policies inside of our API. So let me show you how we can do this. I'll start by creating a dedicated feature folder for the roles. So let's create a roles folder. And inside of it, I'll add another folder that's going to contain my entities, and I will call this the domain folder. So let's create our first type. And of course, I need something to represent my role. Let's go ahead and make this an internal and sealed type. And I really want this to be a simple type. All I need is an identifier. Let's say it's an integer. And then let's also add a name for the role so that we can distinguish them inside of our system. Now, what are the roles that we would like to have? Let's say I want to have two predefined roles. For example, there's going to be an admin role with elevated levels of permission. And there's also going to be a default role called member, which is going to represent the regular application user. So I'll create two constants to represent these roles. And I'll use these roles so that I can easily reference them inside of our system. Now, I'm also going to hard code the identifiers of these roles. And this is just going to make it easier for me to see the roles with EF Core and assign the role to the user when we are registering a new user. You'll see how all of this fits in just a moment. But we also need a way to connect a user inside of our system with the role they are assigned to. So let's create a user role type. And here we could have a user identifier field that's going to tell who is the user assigned to the current role. And the role ID is going to be an integer. And if you want to, you can also include some navigation properties. This will make your EF queries simpler. So let's create the user and the role navigation properties. So these are the two core entities that I will need. Let me move them into their own files. And the next thing I want to do is to configure them with my existing EF Core database context. So let me add another folder. I will call it infrastructure. And inside of this folder, I want to add my entity configuration. So let's call this the role configuration. And this class is going to implement the I entity configuration interface from EF Core. I have to specify my type as the argument. And then I just need to implement the configure method. So let's say that the key of this table is my identifier. And then we also have a name property, which has a maximum length of, let's say, 50. And it's also required in the database. But I also want to seed some initial data inside of this table. I can just create my role instance. And I have my predefined constants to define the admin ID and the name, as well as the member, but I forgot I don't have a constructor. So let me just assign this to the respective properties. So now I'm assigning the values to the name and the identifier. And let's do the same for the member. So I'll say that the role ID is the member and the name is the member constant. So now when I create my database migration, it's going to seed the required data. Now I need another type Let's call it the user role configuration. It has to implement the same interface, except this time for the user role entity. And here, I want to define a composite primary key. So let's say that this is an anonymous type. This is how you define a composite key. And the key values are going to be the user identifier and the role identifier. Now, I also have to configure some foreign key relationships. So I'm going to say that we have one, and I can specify, for example, the user. The user can have many roles. The foreign key here is the user identifier. And we can also configure some delete behavior. Let's say when I delete a user, I want to cascade this to the roles. And then let's do the same for the roles. I'll define the relationships and the foreign keys. Again, I'm going to move this into its own file. And now I can go to my database context 
which is going to pick up these configurations automatically because it's going to scan the current assembly. However, I want to define my two database sets. So let's define the roles and the user roles database sets. Of course, I need to specify the respective types. So here I'm going to use user role and here I will use the role entity. And I'm also going to make this type internal and sealed because my roles and user roles are also internal. So at this point, I can go ahead and create my database migration. I'll open up the package manager console and I'll say add migration, add roles. This will scaffold the database tables that I need, but more importantly, it's also going to seed the initial data into the roles table. You can also see we're getting some indexes and foreign keys, so everything seems to be in order. So that's all I need. This is going to be automatically applied when I start the application. And this takes care of the data management part. So now we can move into the practical part of role-based authorization. What do we need to do? to make this work. Let's go to the register user use case. And here I want to add the user to a specific role after adding it to the database context. So I can simply instantiate a new user role instance, assign the user ID based on the user identifier, and then assign the role identifier based on the constant. And I want my users to be in the member role by default. So now I can say context user roles and add the user role instance. And this is going to persist this in the database when I register a new user. So now my user has their role and we have to connect this to the JSON web token. We're going to do this in the token provider, which will need an additional dependency, my database context. And I'm going to use it to obtain a list of strings representing the user's roles. So I can say await database context user roles where the user role user identifier is equal to the identifier of the current user and what I want to select I want to apply a projection and because we have a navigation property we don't have to do a join so I can access the role navigation property and then the name and then I can say to list async and this will give me back my roles now I need to make this method asynchronous so I'll make it async and it's returning a task of a string and I also need to add a variable for my roles now I'll make this a list of claim types let's call it the claims and I'm doing this so that I can say claims add range and I'll take the user's roles and project them into a claim so now I can say new claim and what is going to be the claim types well there's a predefined claim types class where you can access the role claim. This is what's used by the ASP.NET Core middleware. So I'll use that and then just the role name for the value. And what's going to happen here is we're going to initialize our claims as a list and then append the user's roles as additional claims. If we have just one role, it's going to be a single claim. And if we have multiple roles, it will have multiple claims. So this is what I have to do in the token provider. Now, a couple of more changes are going to be updating the lifetime of the token provider to be a scoped service because I'm depending on the database context, which is configured as a scoped service. And another thing we need to do is fix the calls to this method to now be async so all i need to do is add a wait so this is in the login use case and then let's fix the refresh token use case by just awaiting the token create method and after completing all of this setup the actual application of role-based authorization is surprisingly simple let's pick a use case for example fetching the user by the identifier and all we have to do is update the require authorization method to specify a different policy. So this is applied to my minimal API endpoint. And I want to say policy require role, and this is going to add a requirement. And here I can specify what are the roles that are allowed to access this endpoint. So let's say that the member can access this endpoint as well as an admin user. And this is how I can configure who can do what inside of my API, which is the essence of authorization. And finally, we should be able to test this out. Let's send a post request from Postman to register a new user. I'm going to pick an email that isn't already taken inside of my system. And I'm going to land on the breakpoint in the register user use case. So the part we are interested in is adding the user's role. 
we're going to assign them to the member role. So let's skip ahead to the save changes call. And if I jump into Docker desktop for a moment, you can see the insert statements here. And here is the insert into the user roles table. So this is going to create a user in the respective role. Next, I can attempt to log in this user. We're going to land in the use case, fetch the user, check if they are verified and obtain an access token. And this is what we want to return to the client. So here is the access token that we get back. And if we inspect the access token value on JWTIO, you will see that it contains our role claim and the one role that we have, which is member. If there were multiple roles, we would see multiple claims here, or rather it would be an array of claims. Now I'm going to grab the user's identifier from the subject claim, and let's specify that in the get request to obtain a user. Now I will need to grab the access token as well. Let's apply this in the authorization header, or actually I'm going to apply this on the entire collection. So now let me send a request to fetch a user and you can see that I'm getting back the value. Now if I jump into my code and update the requirement here to require a new role, let's call it spectator and start the application again, and we send another request to our endpoint, you will see that this time we are getting back a 403 forbidden response because we don't have the required role. And this is how you can implement role-based authorization in your .NET applications. If you want to grab the source code for this video, it's going to be available from the pinned comment that's going to be right below. And behind the scenes, I'm going to add a couple of more use cases. In the roles folder, I'll create the create role use case, the update role use case, and the use case for fetching all of the roles. And I'm going to say that you can only access these roles if you are in the admin permission. Of course, I will need to just register these use cases, let's say after the user use cases. So we have get roles, and then let's copy this two more times. And I have the create role and the update role use case. And these are just there so that we can manage the roles inside of our system. And I'm demonstrating how you can lock down specific endpoints so that they are only available to users with a role that has an elevated access level. If you are looking for a simpler way to manage authentication and authorization inside of your system without you having to write all of the code, then I suggest that you watch this video next. Check out my courses to improve your software architecture skills. You can find them from the pinned comment that's going to be right below this video. Thanks again for watching and until next time, stay awesome.